Welcome, as always, to The Truth in a Nutshell, where you get an hour's worth of truth in 10 minutes or less. I am Michael Boldia, your host. These teachings are brought to you by Hand of Help Ministries, and this is the fifth of a five-part series I've entitled The Obvious Lies, and that pretty much catches us up quite nicely. Now, thus far, we've discussed four big lies the church of today keeps telling itself, and that leaves one more which we will be covering today. Now, if it were not so sad, it would be farcical seeing grown men lie to themselves and doing so almost like a mantra, trembling at the knowledge that try as they might to believe otherwise, reality is is shattering their self-deception at every turn. Now, the first big lie is that repentance is unnecessary, that one can come as they are and leave as they came and no one will be the wiser. The second big lie is that the word of God is subjective and relative and is given to our own personal interpretation. The third lie is that this generation is somehow special and that such specialness will not see trials or hardships or tribulations or persecution. The fourth lie men tell themselves is that they can change the mind of God regarding certain pre-established fundamental realities if only they throw enough of a temper tantrum or pitch enough of a fit. And the fifth obvious lie that believers tell themselves, one which has been proven a fallacy due to anecdotal evidence is that the most damaging attacks against the church come from without and not from within. When I say the church, I I mean the true church the ecclesia, the body of Christ, not these fraudulent, illegitimate entities that speak the name of Christ as rarely as possible, and and any time they utter the word repentance is like they have a mouthful of marbles they're trying to talk through. I will say this now, so we get it over with. The most brutal, ongoing, and devastating attacks against the church come from within and not from without. We like to think otherwise. We like to think the most damaging attacks from without are, 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 are what should make us be scared. But the facts prove that this is a fallacy. Somehow we manage to comfort ourselves with this lie, even though all evidence points to the contrary. Because if we were to acknowledge the fact that the most damaging attacks against the household of faith originate from within, we would likewise have to accept the premise that the devil has placed his minions within the church to carry out their nefarious plans and the discernment that ought to be a staple of every fellowship was nowhere in sight in regards to these individuals. What's worse is that even after such men are proven beyond doubt to have been living in sin willfully and habitually, they continue to have their defenders who call them men of God an attempt to justify their sin. There is no call for repentance. There is no call for removal from authority within the body. There's just a shrug of the shoulders, a roll of the eyes, and an unspoken agreement that as long as the crowds come and and, and the tithe is collected, we will overlook even the most heinous of sins and the most heinous of heretical teachings. Because men have become stars rather than disciples of Christ. There is no longer any accountability either to Christ or to his body. They do as they please, being a law unto themselves, and whatever sins they commit and damage they perpetrate upon the household of faith, they find a way to justify it, most often blaming the devil rather than their own weakness and inattentiveness. No, the devil didn't make you do it. The devil can't make you do it. He just extends the platter. You have to reach and take from it. The sad reality is that we accept this lie and do so with great regularity. We tell ourselves this lie continuously because to accept the truth would mean to look at our own selves and realize we did not use all the tools at our disposal to prevent the catastrophes being perpetrated upon the church by men claiming to be spiritual leaders claiming to be pastors, evangelists, and other high-profile, big-name entities. To acknowledge the truth, 
would mean to acknowledge our own culpability in the matter and accept responsibility for our indifference and apathy. When Jesus commanded us to watch ye therefore, we always assumed it was for somebody else. Someone with more responsibility or more established reputation within the church. And so we passed the baton of being careful regarding those we would let teach us and guide us to others, who in turn passed it on to someone else. We've come to believe that as long as the individual has a diploma, then they are called and equipped to teach the truth of God's word and guide people into a closer, more intimate relationship with Christ. When even our own years hear what they're teaching, and and, and it seems anathema, we tell ourselves they must nevertheless know what they're talking about because they have that diploma. If there is one mistake that we've made as the church, it was underestimating the devil's patience and willingness to take his time and put all the pieces in place before the final assault. Even though he knew his time was short, even though he knew the clock was running out, he also knew that the most damage would be done to the household of faith from within its walls rather than from an external source. He knew this, of course, from prior experience because each time the church was persecuted, beaten down, trodden underfoot and thought to be extinct, it rose again stronger, more vibrant, more powerful and more committed than ever before. Much like the coal, which external pressure turns into a diamond, the church seems to thrive under pressure from without. Knowing this and seeing his plan come to naught time and time again, the enemy switched up his tactics, focusing on attacks from within. Attacks meticulously planned and ruthlessly executed to weaken the resolve of the body and to bring shame to the name of Christ. With each pastor exposed and publicly shamed for being less than the man they presented himself as being, with each evangelist having to apologize on national television for his behavior, with each worship leader caught doing untoward things with individuals who trusted them, the light grows that much dimmer. And those who have not as yet laid down their arms grow more weary still. No possible good can come of lying to ourselves, especially when in the same breath we demonize those who still have the audacity to call sin, sin, and who insist upon the truth of Scripture. Even the best of self-deceivers can only deceive themselves but for a season. It can't go on forever. Eventually, things begin to pile up, and the utter weight of it all will shatter the lies we've been repeating to the man in the mirror for so long. I can go off on a tangent and start talking about crossroads and decisions and the need to get serious. But I find these things to be superlative at best. You and I both know the times that we're living in. You and I both know the darkness that continues to grow and that light that continues to dwindle. You and I both know that men tend to gravitate towards those who lie to them and encourage them to lie to themselves rather than speak truth into their lives. We know these things. They are self-evident. And though we can try to delude ourselves, what would be the point? The only question of any import at this juncture is, will we be among the not-so-blissfully ignorant masses, trudging along without a clue as to what is happening all around us, or will we be what the children of God ought to be, aware, awake, sober, watchful, and vigilant. These are the choices before us. And though the obvious lies are obvious to you and I, they seem to have flown under the radar for many a soul. Once again, it seems we've run out of time and wanting to keep to our 10-minute format, I will end the teaching here. However, not before I thank you for joining us and saying, may God bless you.